that idea of having a template is excellent, but it's also advice that you have to use carefully because those templates can go out of date very quickly. So we'll talk about making sure that when you're submitting, you're not submitting what would have been good enough five years ago, as opposed to you're submitting what's expected today. So that's what I'm gonna do. Like I said, if you have questions, type them in the chat. Wendy will keep track of them and we'll answer them at the end. Um, the first thing I'm looking for, the first thing that a reader is looking for in the research, in the method section of a research paper is why this research design. In other words, every choice, right? Whether it's surveys or cases or experiments or secondary data, some combination thereof, all of those choices have positives and negatives, right? They all create strengths to your research, but they also create trade-offs. And so what your job is as a researcher is to show us why the choice that you've made is appropriate for your research question. And you have to work harder as you are at, and the word that keeps popping in my head is weird, and weird's a bad word choice here, but the further you get from what we expect to see, the harder you have to work. What I mean by that is, if the front end of your paper, you tell us there's a great deal of prior research on the topic, you have a very extensive literature review, you have a number of hypotheses, we would then expect to see a methodology that was quantitative and probably with a relatively large sample size. If instead the methodology is followed by cases, that would be highly unusual. Now, unusual is not necessarily bad, but because it's not what we expect to see, you need to explain that much more than you would if in the same setting, right? Great deal of prior research hypotheses, and you did indeed have a very large sample using secondary data, right? So the further you get from kind of the expected, the more time you have to expend explaining why you've made the choices that you've made. Why is this appropriate for your research question? The other set of research that typically requires more justification is qualitative. Qualitative is a bad choice here. What I really mean is theory building work. And it's not because we're somehow biased against qualitative work or theory building. I would argue the opposite, that often good quality theory building research is the most impactful because it opens up new areas of knowledge. The problem is that when we think about normal science, what we as scientists do on a regular basis, it's mostly theory testing and theory elaboration. So when you're going to move into an open space, when you're going to develop new theory, when you're going to typically use qualitative methods, you need to provide a case why that's needed. What is it about this phenomenon we don't currently understand? What's new and different here? Because typically the choice to do theory building, while it op can open up a new space of knowledge, it also implies some significant trade-offs in terms of the likely validity and reliability of that knowledge or the ability of that knowledge to generalize outside of your limited context, right? So this is the first thing you have to do. The second overarching goal is transparency. I've got a few slides where the, the font is in red. This is not even more important than everything else, but these are um, templates. So, and I'm sure the other editors in the room will say the same, but at least to JSCM, if we find ourselves writing the same thing over and over again in decision letters, we create a template where we try and get the wording just right so that we can convey the message very clearly and so that we don't have to type the same thing over and over again. This is our template for transparency. Transparency is unfortunately one of the common problems that we see in method sections. And what I mean by transparency is that your paper needs to provide a clear path from your raw data to your conclusions. We can't be guessing how you reached your conclusions. We can't be guessing what data was used. We can't be guessing what methodology was used and so on. And you need to provide that level of transparency for two related reasons. One is to assess the validity and reliability of the current study. Absent that clear path, we don't have the ability to truly judge your claims of knowledge creation. 
Equally, we can't build on your research, right? So if you think of a body of knowledge, it requires us replicating and building on each other's studies. And if we don't really know what the previous study did, we can't build on it appropriately. Because if we find different things in the previous researchers, we're not quite sure why, right? So you need to provide that level of transparency. And in the past, we often use space as an excuse not to do this. Oh, I only have 32 pages. I can't possibly tell you everything I did in my multi-method study. That may have been true 20 years ago. It's no longer true today. With maybe one exception in our discipline, every journal is very welcoming of online supplements. And so it's your job as an author to make sure that you provide this information. Create an online on supplement, include it as part of your submission. Be very clear in the cover letter that you've included this thing. And you'll know, say something, I realize that this is a lot of extra information, but we've provided this because we believe that the reviewers might ask for it and this way they have it. And if we are lucky enough to publish our journal and your most awesome of journal, of our paper and your most awesome of journals, then we can have a discussion about what, if any of this content is actually required for publication. But we wanna make sure sure that the review process is transparent. And if it's that one journal that still has trouble with this idea, then at least put this information in the cover letter so they know that you are aware that the reviewers are gonna ask for it and you're perfectly willing to share it. And a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about today is really about how to provide that clarity because absent that clarity, we just can't judge the quality of your work. The third thing that I'm looking for, and clearly these these three big things relate to each other. The third thing comes back to that idea that all research designs induce trade-offs and they can all be done well or poorly. So part of justifying your choice of a research design is understanding those trade-offs and showing that they're appropriate for your research question. So for example, a cross-sectional survey has a significant limitation in that it cannot show causality. However, cross-sectional surveys can be really useful in certain settings, especially if it's an area of knowledge where we think that a relationship exists. We've had a lot of prior studies, but they're all with really small samples or they're qualitative. And so we can do a cross-sectional survey where we have a large sample size that's representative of the population. And it allows us to do a first robust check to say, hey, does this relationship exist? Right? So for the first America's wide test of the relationship between environmental management and supply chain resilience, a cross-sectional survey might be a really appropriate choice. However, if we have 50 prior papers on that relationship that already show that it exists, now you're not adding anything to the conversation, right? So the exact same research design becomes far less appropriate. So your job is to be aware of that limitation and show why it is appropriate for your research question. In addition, part of being transparent is showing how is while A, it's being aware of the limitations and B, it's showing how you deal with or mitigate those limitations if you can, right? right? So perhaps in this same example, you would note that, hey, we know that this doesn't actually provide evidence of causality, but when we designed the survey, we asked about investments in environmental management made over the last decade. And we asked about supply chain resilience in the current year. We tried to create at least some, we tried to put the respondents in that mindset that there was some past and present, right? It's still not causal, but it's better than just saying, how much have you invested in environmental management? How resilient are you, right? The key issue here being aware and transparent. And what this gets us to is that what you're trying to convey in the entire method section is that what you did was robust, but you're not lying or hiding anything, right? So if the, the past slide was about being aware of the limitations and being clear what you can and can't do, the second thing you have to do in a method section is show us that having made that choice, you did it well. Right, so every design has some basic expectations and this is where that template becomes really useful, right? If you've got that template or if you've got those three templates sitting in front of you, you can look and say, okay, what are the things that every one of these talks about? What are the things that the, this checklist of expected things for this methodology? 
So for instance, if I'm reading an experimental paper, I expect to see a sentence that says something along the lines of, you know, that participants were randomly assigned to different treatments. I expect to see that. That said, random assignment is not always possible and sometimes it might not even be appropriate. So if you didn't do random assignment, for instance, let's say you did a field experiment and it was in a factory and shift one got one treatment and shift two got a second treatment because the treatment involved resetting up the workspace and so on. That's a very valid reason for not doing random assignment as long as you explain why, right? As long as it's clear. So what I'm looking for here is that, you know, if there are expected things, you provide them. And if you didn't do those expected things, you tell us why. And again, there are always good reasons for exceptions. And often the best research does something a little bit unusual, but it's got to be explained, right? So that's kind of your overarching goal, the, the, the three big things I'm looking for in a method section, right? And you can certainly see how they feed into each other. To justify your methodology, you have to be aware of its strengths and its limitations. To be transparent, you have to make sure that you've done everything well, and so on. The second half of what I'm going to do then is going to be some specific areas where, you know, and some specific things we're looking for in a method section. And the first is information about your population and sample. So far too many papers have just one or two sentences. And the first sentence is saying our firm is all, our sample is all firms in CompuStat with complete data from 2016 to 2021. Or the example I'm gonna use is our sample is comprised of multinational medical device manufacturing companies located in Ireland. And that'll be followed by, and we surveyed 300 of these companies. And that's all you tell us. That is insufficient. And so if you get a letter from JSCM or any other journal where they suggest that you have a convenient sample, convenient sample is not a compliment. Convenient sample is almost always a serious problem. And the issue here is that typically if we think that you have a convenient sample, we don't know what population it could reflect and we don't know what it could be used to generalize to. That said, the real issue here is not whether or not it's a convenient sample, because a lot of research uses what's effectively a convenient sample, but you need to justify the convenient sample. So what I'm looking for in this section of the paper, questions that a reader and a reviewer should be able to answer. First and foremost, what population is this supposed to be representative of? So go back to my Irish multinational medical device manufacturing companies. Are you interested in manufacturers in small countries? Ireland's certainly a small country. High wage countries, we are also a very high wage country. In tax havens, we can do that. Are you interested in complex manufacturing or complex products? Because medical devices are complex products. Are you interested in multinationals, right? Any or all of those things could be the reason that you chose that sample. You need to tell me why. And this is just as true for a large sample size survey or secondary data type study as it is for a case. In a case study, you might not be attempting to generalize back to a population, but you have still selected your cases or your ethnography or the sites where you did your interventions, whatever it is that you're doing. You've done that for a reason, because of their ability to shed light on the phenomenon and hopefully to shed light on that phenomenon, not just where you're observing it, but in other places. That needs to be clear. From there, who did you actually ask for data, right? So let's assume that there are 700 of these Irish medical device manufacturing companies. Did you ask all 700 of them? Did you randomly select 350 of them? Or perhaps you purposefully selected 350 of them. And neither randomly or purposely is necessarily right or wrong. We tend to believe, tend to focus on a well, random representation of the population is better. And that's true if you have a relatively large sample, but you might have really good reasons for having a purposeful selection. Maybe you only selected the largest of those companies because of those 700, maybe a few hundred of them are really tiny. Maybe you purposely selected the ones that have very diverse product ranges because you were interested in the complexity of what they did. 
the key issue here is that you tell us, right? If you say that there are 700 of these these we sent surveys to 350, we have to know how you got to the 350. Finally, what's your final sample used in the analysis? And don't just tell me the size, though of course I'd like to know the size, and yes, we do get papers where they don't tell us the sample size, um, but what's the composition of that sample? You know, are, how many of them are big companies, small companies, and so on? Is it representative of the sampling frame in the population? And this is, to me anyway, this is one of those places where people answer the wrong question. Because what we typically see when papers get to this point that have problems with the sampling, where they probably do have a convenience sample, is that they try and convince us they have a representative sample using a completely inappropriate test, as opposed to telling us they have a bias sample and being able to tell us why. So what I mean by that is we often see papers with things like the Armstrong and Overton test where you compare early responders to late responders. Now the Armstrong and Overton test was created over beers in 1977. It has absolutely no validity. Nobody has ever failed that test. It is basically useless. But people do that because they think they're giving a veneer of showing that they have proper representation. What we would much rather see is you tell us that, well, we know that our sample is biased to large companies, it's biased to companies with more complicated products and so on. That's almost never a deal killer. That's just being honest about your limitations. In other words, telling me that the sample is not representative and then telling me how specifically it's not representative is better than not being able to tell me if it's representative or not. Hopefully I clarified that, but if not, ask at the end. What next? The who, what, where, and when of data collection. Who is sometimes answered just by telling us where the data came from? This is especially true with secondary data sources, right? In essence, we're asking who provided it. So if you tell me you use CompuStat data or that you use data on um, environmental breaches from the Environmental Protection Agency, the who of the providing the data is typically clear enough and or in the case of CompuStat, it's used frequently enough that we know the answer. But in a lot of cases, especially when you collect primary data, we need to know who you actually got it from. So go back to my Irish medical device manufacturing companies. That's who we collected data from. But if my research question is on say buyer supplier relationships, who I asked in each one of those companies could be very different. I could have asked buyers. I could have asked people in marketing. I could have asked the CEOs, I could have asked all three. You need to tell me who the actual entities were within the organization who provided the information. Or if it was members of a team, which team or team members provided the information and so on, right? And don't say things like we collect the data from key informants without telling us who the key informants are and why they were the appropriate key informants. If you prefer, and this is really just a different way of saying transparency, when you're telling us who provided the data, make sure that the reader can clearly assess how comparable information is from each unit of analysis, right? So if some of your respondents were CEOs and others were summer interns, for most research questions, that's problematic, right? That the CEO has a very different experience and knowledge base than the summer intern. However, if you are asking them about preferences for like, you know, next day delivery, and it was a logistics paper, that might be perfectly fine. The point being, you need to allow, allow the reader to assess whether or not each unit of analysis has comparable information, right? And equally, you need to provide the information so that a future researcher could do something similar. Now, there's something else here as well. If your data is hard to get, Let's say you had a call companies and you had, you know, you were interested in who had responsibility for making sustainability risk assessments. There is probably no job title that captures that. And there's probably different people in different organizations who do that. And so getting to that information might have required talking to three or four different people. And, you know, maybe you had to do a pre-interview to make sure they're the right person and so on. Provide that information. Now you're providing that information both to be transparent but it also has a benefit to you as an author that what you're also showing the reviewers and future readers is, wow, this information was difficult to get. And because it was difficult to get, maybe my sample is not as big as I would like, or maybe it's not as perfect as I would like, but given how hard it was to get, 
you got to cut me a little bit of slack. And typically, if you do a good job of telling that story, you do get that a little bit of extra space, right? When the information is easy to get, the quality we expect from it is significantly higher than when it's really difficult to get, especially if it's information we've never seen before. All right, next thing. What data did you actually collect? Every time I read this slide, I smirk. Um, and I probably just did again now because it seems like th this should be a no brainer, but we get far too many papers where I'm not 100% sure. So we see sentences like, we used a semi-structured interview protocol that was updated after each case, but we never actually see the protocol. Well, absent the protocol, I don't actually know what questions were asked, what data was collected. So you need to provide me the protocol, right? Um, if the protocol changed over time, there should be some way to show us what was added as you went. What was the original protocol? What was the final protocol? This is the type of thing that has to be in a supplement if it's not in the main body of the paper. And if it's that one or two journals that absolutely has that hard page limit, in a minimum, put a sentence in that says that, you know, the protocol is available if the reviewers want to see it, because inevitably they're going to ask to see it if they ask you for a revision, right? Be clear that you know that this information is information that reviewers would want. And again, these problems happen with all different types of research designs. We get survey papers where all we see is our survey was adapted from this previous researcher. And they don't actually tell us what items they actually used or how they adapted them, if they adapt them, right? We get experimental papers where the vignette's not included and so on. So you have to tell us what data you actually collected. Um, taking this a step further, when we're judging the validity and reliability of your results, the first thing we need to judge is the validity and reliability of your measures. So we need to have really precise information about how you measured your constructs. Um, lots of examples here, right? So if you're doing a survey, we frequently see survey papers where they give us an example item, but they don't give us the entire set of items. One example doesn't cut it. We need all of the items. So we need the items pre-purification and post-purification. If you did case studies and you asked the respondents to also provide secondary data, and this is a classic, right? We ask them for secondary additional data sources that we use for triangulation. And you never tell us what additional data you collected and you never show any evidence that you triangulated with. it. That doesn't come, right? You need to provide complete information on what you collected. And this applies for all constructs not just your primary independent and dependent variables, right? So we frequently see control variables that aren't well explained, right? So things like we control for firm size. Well, I can control for firm size a lot of different ways. It can be number of employees, it can be profitability, it can be revenues and so on. So you need to tell me how you control for firm size. Equally, if you did some kind of calculation to get to that variable, you need to make sure that that calculation is clear, right? So we controlled past performance as the average of ROI for the last past three years. That's good, but it would be better if you were really clear what you meant by the past three years, because I'm not 100% sure if you mean year zero to three with your dependent variable in year four, or if you mean year zero to three with your dependent variable in year three, right? You need to clarify that. And if there's any part of the paper where you have to provide everything, it's this one. In other words, there are bits of the paper where you may get away with the excuse we didn't have space, but not being clear about your measures is inexcusable. This is the most, you know, if you think about the place where you absolutely can't say full details available from authors if requested, this is the place you absolutely can't do that because absent this information, we can't judge the rest of the paper. The next two, if so, if the last ones you absolutely must, these are probably a little bit less important and they probably vary a lot more depending on what you did. Um, so for instance, sometimes it's really important to be clear of the where of data collection. Was it face-to-face? -face? Was it by phone interviews? Did you use a web survey? Was it paper and pencil? Um, and these things tend to become more important um, if you have, say for instance, um, socially desirable constructs, 
Um, they also become more important if you're mixing different data collection methodologies, right? So if you have some face-to-face -face interviews and you've got some that are done in a you know semi-anonymous fashion, there's lots of evidence that people's response formats can differ depending on how much or how little anonymity they think they have, right? So it's really important that if you're mixing response formats, that you're clear about why you mix them and preferably not just the why you mix them, but you provide data to show that mixing them doesn't change the results. That we got the same results from the sample of people who were interviewed over the phone as the people who were interviewed face to face. There's also the issue of the when your data was collected. And this one is always a bit tricky. Um, and I know one of the things we were talking about in the last session, our group was about data reuse. And implicit in data reuse is also the age of the data. And we all would like to have the opportunity to get the largest number of appropriate papers out of a data set that we collected. Right? We put a lot of work into doing that. And I think we all accept that that can be done very well. Unfortunately, sometimes the age of your data does matter. A lot of times it doesn't, right? If you're looking at a phenomenon that is stable over time and your data is five years old, maybe that's fine, but you need to tell us that your data is five years old or 20 years old. We do occasionally see that papers that the data looks quite old, but you think about the phenomenon you're like, oh, it really doesn't matter. Um, on the other hand, sometimes relatively new data is already out of date. So I presently have a very unfortunate PhD student, not just because I'm his supervisor, but because his dissertation is on supply chain risk management. And he was about three quarters of the way done. It's qualitative. So I think he collected eight or nine of his planned 12 cases come March of 2020. Given his topic, he can't combine data on supply chain risk management from pre-COVID and post-COVID, right? Supply chain risk managers have just had an event they never thought they would see happen. Their entire thinking about risk and resilience and so on has been called into question. He can't fill out his research design, right? So he's stuck with two unpalatable choices. One is he collects those final cases and he can't compare the old data with the new data. Or two is that he's stuck with just the old data, which is an incomplete research design. And in all fairness, he's gonna have a lot of trouble publishing because people are gonna go, that no longer applies, right? His data is a year old and it's already out of date. Other people have 20 year old data and it's fine. So you have to be really good. When was the data collected? And if the data is old, you need to explain why we shouldn't care. From there, we start to move into the analysis. And one of the things that is often missing in papers, and this is more likely to be missing in quantitative papers than qualitative papers, is the data preparation. And the reason I say that is qualitative researchers are usually know that they have to share information on how they took their raw, right? Their transcripts or their observations or whatever it was that they collected, that they know that they have to provide information on how they coded. Right? But often they don't provide complete information, but at least they provide some information, right? So I'm looking for complete information on who coded it, if there weren't multiple coders, why, what did you code? Was it transcripts, notes from memory? Was it based on filming your interventions, whatever? How did you handle disagreements? Did you use software? Um, and I'm also looking for you to show me, especially if you've created new constructs, Right? If you've created new constructs in a qualitative piece of research or in a theory building piece of research, those new constructs are often a core component of your contribution. We need to know where they came from. That said, like I said, qualitative researchers at least typically start down this path. They may not do it well, but they at least know they have to provide something. Quantitative researchers often completely skip telling us what they did to prepare the data. Um, there's nothing about missing data how much of it there was, was it missing at random? If there was missing data, what'd you do with it? Did you drop it? Did you impute it? If you imputed it, how did you impute it? Did that change anything by doing so? And so on, so that's often missing. Similarly, there's often no information on outliers. So the assumption is that you must not have had any if you didn't mention them, 
But if you did and you don't tell us, that's highly problematic, right? So if you had outliers, how did you identify them? Again, what percentage of the data was it? What did you do with them? Did you drop them? Did you transform them? If you did transformations of the data, which construct or constructs did you transform? How were they transformed? And then finally, at the end of all this data preparation, um, especially when we see multiple data sets being matched to each other, the, the sample size can drop amazingly. Um, one of our, the papers we're working on presently, we start with a sample of close to 400,000. We do the analysis with somewhere around 30,000. That's pretty typical in secondary data papers, but to not at least acknowledge that the representatives of the sample may have changed when all that data was dropped is problematic. You need to go back and say, okay, we did all this stuff to get our final sample. Is it still representative of what we started with? let alone the population we plan to talk about as a whole, right? So these are things I'd be looking for. When we get to the analysis, again, another place where I have trouble not smirking when I read my own slides, but tell us what you did. It's often not clear what you did. If you wanna be a bit more nuanced with that, things that are often missing, right? So if you had, If you have measures, especially in, say in a survey paper and there's nothing on measure development or construct validation, that's problematic. Qualitative papers that start talking about results without it giving any indication of how you arrived at the results, right? So there's no discussion of analysis, there's just results. And we do see this very frequently. Or we see multiple case study papers where they start with cross case analysis. They never tell us about the within case analysis. This is problematic, right? We need to know what you all did to get to your conclusions, right? So the basics of the analysis, tell us what you did. Don't skip steps. If you prefer things that we should be able to find in your paper in the analysis section, it should be clear what data was used to reach each conclusion. And this is often not the case, right? So for instance, if the sample size changes for each hypothesis test, the data used for each hypothesis test is changing. Going back to that paper I was just talking about in mind, we just spent two days because the person who did the analysis. There are, I think, six hypothesis tests. Five of the six are at a quarterly basis. The six is on a yearly basis. The sample size, needless to say, changes, or the number of observations changes when you go from quarters to years. And all of us read the paper and all of us got to that one test and it's like, what the hell happened to the sample? And well, like I said, we spent an inordinate amount of time emailing in circles before someone remembered, oh yeah, that's right, that one test was done at a yearly level. If the authors aren't sure what's going on, imagine what the reviewers would have said when they got to that, right? You gotta be clear what data was used to reach each conclusion. If you've got a proposition in a qualitative study, it should clearly evolve from the analysis to be linked back to raw data. So if you think about in a lot of qualitative papers, when they present their propositions, they also present indicative quotes. The reason they're presenting those indicative quotes is to show you this is raw data that links back to this proposition. This is how we went from that starting point, what the respondents told us, to our endpoint, our propositions. And this is how it all fits together, right? This is how we get that nice clean path. If you've got multiple experiments, a conclusion should be linked to a specific experimental result. Don't just say the results of the experiment say this, right? If you've got three of those experiments, I would like to know which experiment or how you've combined multiple experiments to get to that conclusion. I expect a discussion of what you did with missing or dropped or excluded data points, right? It should be clear what happened to them, and if you did drop or exclude data points, did those change your results? Uh, and I want the full results. And this is kind of our segue into the next step, right? Um, that what we expect to see in a paper today in terms of the results is much more expansive than what we would have expected even a few years ago. So if you've done a test, you almost always should provide the full results. I can imagine only a couple of instances where it would be acceptable to just say, we did this test and the results were fine. They were significant, they were insignificant and move on. We almost always wanna see the results. And we almost always wanna see the complete results. 
and this kind of gets us back to that template, right? So the template is, again, it's an awesome piece of advice, but it's a piece of advice that you have to use carefully because the reality of being a researcher is that our expectations are continuously evolving and they tend to evolve in only one direction. We don't expect less in the future. We almost always expect more, right? So when I started at JSCM about five years ago, I don't think in the first year, year and a half, I ever had a reviewer or an AE send me a note saying that, hey, you know, this paper, um, all of their tables just say controls included and they don't actually provide me the results with the controls. I want to see the results with the controls. I get that email all the time now. Right, and it's not just results with controls, but it's basically, I want to see the tests. I want to see what you did. It's no longer good enough to just tell me you did it. I want to see it. Taking that a step further in some fields, medicine, this is certainly the case. Um, psychology is starting to be the case. Hasn't happened in supply chain yet, but it's starting. And what we're starting to see is that certain journals are asking us to provide our data when we submit a paper for review. So if you submit to management science today, they will ask you if you can share your data. And if you can't, they want you to explain why, or maybe you can share some, but not all of it. This is a changing expectation. It's something that you, especially the majority of the people in the audience who are early career researchers, this is something you should expect to be doing in your career. And what this meet really is getting at is that in the past, we were much more likely to treat a lack of transparency as, sin, as a sin of omission. Oh, the author forgot to put this in. Oh, they didn't have space and so on. Today, we tend to treat a lack of transparency as a sin of commission, that you've done it purposefully. Um, and the reasons for that are multiple. One is that we have the space today, right? We've got the online supplements. So space is really not an excuse most of the time. In addition, we know an awful lot more about the prevalence of things like p-hacking, or if you prefer torturing the data till it gives you the answer you'd like, inappropriate reuse of data and other questionable research practices. And hence today, when we don't have the information we need, we tend to view it as a cynic commission. If you prefer, this is a way to put the reviewers in a bad mood and have them go looking for reasons to reject your paper which is not what you want, right? You want them to be looking for reasons to accept your paper. So again, with that template, the template is a starting point, but it's not enough. You need to be very aware of how your field is changing and evolving. Um, so not just get that template and have it next to you, but also be really aware of, are there recent editorials or methods pieces in the journal that you're submitting to? or maybe related journals. So one of the things that you may or may not have seen is that JOM has had a couple of conceptual pieces in the last few years on experimental methods, especially around things like the use of vignettes. If you're submitting a paper in an operations or supply chain journal today, where you're using a vignette study and you aren't acknowledging that conversation and showing how you meet the criteria that's coming out of that conversation, you're probably in trouble even if what you did was perfectly fine two years ago. And I can give you plenty of other examples of things that have changed, right? So when we took over at JSM, or at least when I started, the, the last remaining one from five years ago, we would have still seen Armstrong and Overton tests. We occasionally still saw a Harmon's one factor test. Well, you won't today, right? If you think about endogeneity sections in the typical paper today, most of us didn't write I couldn't say the word five years ago. I still probably can't say it today, but I think I've got it, right? But today to see a quantitative paper without an endogeneity section is unusual, right? Those expectations keep changing. So yes, get your template, but remember that template. So you've got a template from JSCM that was published in 2020. The research was probably originally submitted in 2018. That means it was designed in 2016. You're starting today, you're five years out of date. You wanna be up to date, right? So you wanna be aiming for best practice when your paper's gonna be published, not best practice before your paper was even envisioned, right? So you, you wanna make sure that not just do you have that template, but you know how the field is changing and evolving. And 
you need to be transparent about your limitations. So if in the process of doing your research, the, the world has moved on a little bit, and maybe now you're not at the cutting edge you thought you were, don't hide it. Because that annoys us way more than being truthful about it and trying to show us why perhaps it's okay. So when I put this all together, the good method section is clear on the design choices made and provides a clear and compelling justification for these choices. Again, there are always trade-offs. We wanna know why you made those trade-offs relative to your research question. It's clear on what if any data preparation or cleaning was done prior to analysis, and especially if that changes the representativeness of the sample or if that changes the results we need to know about. And provides the reader a clear path to assess the validity and reliability of both your measures and your results, right? It provides that level of transparency. Part of that means that you provide complete results. Part of that means that you link conclusions to specific data and specific analyses. You don't let the, leave the reader guessing how you reached a conclusion. It follows best practice while being clear on the limitations, whether they are limitations that were designed in. So going back to that cross-sectional survey example, that's a limitation you designed in, but you're clear about it. Or it could be a limitation because data collection didn't work out as you expected. Perhaps you were trying to have a representative sample and for whatever reason your sample is biased, but you, you're clear that it's biased, why it's biased, and what we can do about it in future research. And if you do all these things, then that means that a future research will be able to replicate some or all of what you've done. We can build the body of knowledge. We can build out new theories and so on. So that is my prepared material. I will happily try and answer questions at this point. Um, have at it. Thanks, Mark. That was fantastic as always. So I haven't seen a lot of questions come from the, um, the audience yet. So, you know, that just opens up the floor for me to ask every question that I want to get answered. <laughs> so, so please think of your questions, add them into the chat or just raise your hand and, and we'll happily um, call on you. But one of the things that you brought up was being sharing or being willing to share your data. And, you know, I can, I personally, I think that's a fantastic idea, but I'm wondering your positioning on that in terms of qualitative data. Yeah, I mean, every time we bring this topic up, people say, but I can't, everybody else should, but I can't. There are certainly data protection issues and anonymity issues with qualitative data, just like there can be with quantitative data. That doesn't mean you can't share some of it or you can't provide part of the transcripts, right? I mean, the reality is that you're going to be asked for this data. And my guess is that over time, today you can get away with saying my data is qualitative. I promise the respondents full anonymity. I can't share it with you. You can probably get away with that. But that over time, people are going to start sharing. They're going to share snippets or they're going to share, you know, kind of a redacted clean version. No names of people, no names of companies, no names of products, but you'll still be able to see how they talked about some of the issues. And you'll start to see that provided. And as you see more and more of that, the expectation is also going to go up on you. So I'd be prepared for that. Um, and, you know, it's going to be the same thing with every other type of data that, um, or maybe you can share it for review purposes, but you can't share it with the final paper, right? A different pathway, but you're gonna be asked and it's gonna, the onus is gonna be on you to convince the reviewers why you should be able to not share when others are sharing. Yeah, I tend to agree. I just, the one question, now we're starting to get questions in the chat, but the, you know, when, when people, since I do a lot of qualitative research, you know, the question I always get is, given your same data set, would I come to the same results as you did? And, you know, I'm wondering if reviewers actually could or would take the time to go in and, you know, look through that data set, because it would, it, it's pretty hard to, to show that link from, here's my data, here's what was said to our propositions and results. So, yeah, I mean, there are two answers to that. One is, and I'm paraphrasing, but I believe Yin says that your job as qualitative researchers is to show that you reached an 
a valid and reliable conclusion, not potentially the only valid and reliable conclusion from that data, but a valid and reliable conclusion from that data, and that somebody else might interpret it differently. And I actually think that might be kind of cool as we get more comfortable with this. Yeah. Um, the other thing, and you certainly see it in other disciplines, especially in the sciences, it is pretty common for viewers to rerun your analysis. Um, and you often turn in the data and your code and they tell you your code is wrong. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. you know, and, but that's, to me, that's part of the scientific process, right? Um, but again, we have to get used to that. We're not doing it yet, but I, I'm pretty sure we will. All right, cool. Um, so Marcelo has a question out there in the chat for you. Uh, Marcelo, are you out there? I'm here. Thank oh, why don't you, why don't you go ahead and ask your question to Mark? Sure. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Mark, for your presentation. I found it very helpful. I, you give us an excellent overview about both methods. Uh, my question is about uh, how do you evaluate about uh, the necessity to use this uh, softwares for uh, qualitative data analysis. Do you think that it's essential? Um, so my answer is really biased because I've never used software when doing qualitative analysis. So I clearly don't think it's essential. Um, I think it's important to say if you use the software. I don't think that using or not using the software necessarily matters. I can imagine if you, you know, if you've got a qualitative study where you have a lot of respondents, but they weren't giving you a whole lot of information. So maybe you interviewed a few hundred people, but each of those interviews is only five minutes. I would be much more likely to expect to see software in that setting. And to not see software, I'd be a little bit worried that you would really reduce the data dramatically. Um, so the, I think the software is a signal just of how you did it. But equally, it gets back to that idea. If somebody else was given the same data set, would they reach similar conclusions? Um, so that was a yes, no question. And I gave you a much longer answer. So no, it's not essential to use the software. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And, and Susanna wants to know if we are already asking for data and asking authors to submit the data at the Journal of Supply Chain Management. We are not, we're, we're taking a softly, softly approach, but if you submit a paper today, you will see that it asks you about various open science initiatives. Do you wish to share your data? Did you um, pre-register your research design? I can't remember what the other ones are, but those are the two main things. And if you did do those things, we will acknowledge it with your paper. So that's our initial foray into this. Um, We've discussed it a few times as a group. Uh, I'm sure they'll discuss it again when I leave at the end of this year. Um, so we've put the journal on that path, but we're, we're walking down it relatively slowly at this point. All right, cool. And then Daphne has a question. And so Daphne, can you talk to Mark directly about your question? Hi, thank you. Good morning. Uh, so you already mentioned a little bit about the, the how to manage the size of your paper. So what do you think it makes sense to put uh, in the paper, in the method section, or in the appendices, appendices in the complementary attachment? So what do you suggest to, to mention? And uh, Yeah, and in a perfect world... Decided. Yeah, in a perfect world, the appendices and supplement would have material that the person really wanted to know more could access, but that somebody could read the main body of the paper and wouldn't need to go to those. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, sometimes if your paper's got a lot of data, it's really complicated, you can't quite achieve that. But I mean, that, that's always my starting point, that I want the main paper to tell the primary story and my appendices and supplement in other words, if you think about a researcher reading your paper, they're either going to be interested just sort of the results and how does that inform the ongoing debate? And maybe they're only interested in something tangential. And then maybe 10% are going to be really interested in what you did, either because they're going to do something similar, or maybe they're interested in some of the same constructs, but in a different model, and they want to see the specific relationships. And those people need to be able to find that information. 
So I, you know, that's how I try and picture it in my head that I, you know, for 90% of the readers, do they have the information they need? And that's why I try and keep in the main body. And I realize this is a pretty vague answer, but it really does depend on the paper. And then for the people who are really interested or the, you know, the really, you know, the people who are really interested in the analysis, they can find it. Um, okay, I'll, I'll get away with that, but. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. It was a little bit vague, Mark, I can tell you. So it's, it's right. It depends, Wendy. <laughs> Oh man, my favorite answer. Um, so, so Mark, you kind of touched on a couple of things. You may or may not want to go down this path, but during your presentation, you talked about a couple of things like um, age of data and data reuse and, and things of that nature. Are there like red flags to you when, I, I mean, we can talk about it from an ethical perspective or just sort of in general, are there red flags when you get a, a methodological, a paper and you're reviewing methodology that you just go, I, I can't even look at this? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, certainly there are things that we all have our pet peeves, right? Um, you started though talking about, you know, the idea of data reuse and age of data. And so I, I assume you're really thinking about red flags in that space. Uh, probably the biggest red flag is when we get a paper and you know one of the questions JSCM asks, and as far as I know, pretty much every journal asks the same question or a similar one, you know, has this data been used previously? And the answer with the submission is no. And then when I open the paper, the first thing the plagiarism software tells me is there's a lot of plagiarism in the paper. And when I open the paper, all the plagiarism is in the method section because it's data you, the authors have used previously, and you're using a lot of the same verbiage. Now, if you had told me that up front, I'd be annoyed with the plagiarism, but you know, if your cover letter and or that section where it asked, did you use the data before? It was very clear, hey, this is the same data from this previous project. We're really struggling how we could describe it differently because you know this is the data, this is how we collected it and so on. Um, and you're really completely open with me about that. And you show me that what you're doing in the, the current paper makes a significant contribution relative to the previous paper. Then we might have to have a conversation about rewriting the methods section or a conversation about how you just refer readers to the original paper because it's the same data. If you don't tell me all that and I figure it out on my own, we're having a different conversation because now you've tried apparently to hide from me that this data has been used previously. Um, and that usually doesn't go well. So that, that, that would certainly be annoying. Um, that would really piss me off if that was the question. <laughs> It, it's interesting and Ting Ting not to put you on the spot and Dave just be ready for me to put you on the spot too but you know in terms of method methodologies are there red flags to you as you're looking through newly submitted manuscripts yeah I think what the uh, mark just covered is uh, very important particularly are you up to date on the methodology no, no matter what methodology you're talking about but you are are you are you citing some of most recent uh, major uh, methodology or editorial from major journal basically showing that you have you have done your homework you, you know the most recent um, 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 methodology or things that you need to check, right? Some of the tests. And are you providing any very old citation <laughs> your, to justify your methodology? Um, and that plagiarism definitely is something that annoyed me as well. <laughs> um, so, so I think those are those are kind of a quick check, like a first round to decide whether you have a okay methodology, right? Uh, and then, of course, we'll rely on the AE uh, and reviewers to do a thorough check. Yeah, awesome. And Dave, what are your thoughts on, like, what would, as Mark will say, annoy you? <laughs> I don't know if um, annoy me is, is so much as really trying to um, help the community understand what is a good research methodological approach. And so I put in the chat box two excellent articles. One was by um, Barb Flynn, Mark, and Brian Fugate on survey research methods. 
and I think the purpose of that article was really to help the community understand um, where uh, survey research methods um, can really be helpful to uh, scholars and how to use them uh, more appropriately. Um, and then the other article was by Miko Katsokivi and Dan Guide, and how I guess they were annoyed on one, how as a community, we were not really providing causal evidence when testing research questions and misusing statistical techniques um, in our research. Um, I don't know, Mark, if you would want to comment a little bit more about your JSCM article on survey. <laughs> Well, we wrote that article because we were sick and tired of <laughs> reviewing survey papers that weren't done very well. Um, you know, and to be really transparent about that, I mean, I think both Barb and I took it somewhat personally because both Barb and I had done a lot of survey research and we felt that by people doing that research poorly, it reflected badly on our own research as well. Um, that said, I mean, one of my kind of fundamental, I guess it's a belief, is that, you know, all research methodologies can be good or bad, depending on the context and the research question. And so rather than writing an editorial, which others did, which basically said, we will no longer ever consider certain survey research designs, we want to be a little bit Oh, I hate to say more thoughtful, but we want to be, we want to leave a lot more space and ask the question, when would this research design be appropriate? Um, and I, I think that's, you know, I, I go back to that, those things I'm looking for in a paper. I want to see clear evidence from the authors that they've thought about that. Why is this research design appropriate for my setting? Because again, I can't think of any, you know, I know in certain fields like medicine, they talk about experiments as a gold standard. They are not a gold standard in operations and supply chain management. There are certain things we can't really do very well with experiments, right? We don't have a gold standard. Instead, we have a bunch of different ways to build, elaborate, and test theory. And the question becomes, have you made a good choice for your research question? And then have you executed it well? And one thing I just want to uh, make a comment about, I don't think we're against survey research. As a <laughs> no, <topic. that's> good point. <laughs> we're, 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 I think our expectations is that the research approach needs to be executed uh, very well. Um, yeah. And one of the things I think Mark and Barb and Brian and, and Dan Guide and Miko are saying is that I think people have not raised their expectations in terms of what is a, a very well thought out research design. Yeah, and the same thing, you know, with those more recent editorials on doing experiments and JOM, they're doing the same thing, right? They're asking us to think about our expectations and to evolve them, um, in essence, to catch up with other fields. Yeah.